Hello and welcome. My name is Terrence Barkin. I'm the Executive Director of the Graphene Council and we are today's host for Graphene Functionalization and Enhancement. The format is that I will give a brief introduction of the Graphene Council, followed by presentations from Mito Materials, followed by Haydale, and then we will have Q&A sessions. First of all, I'd like to make everyone aware as the Graphene Council is a forum for companies in the entire supply chain. We do follow antitrust regulations and guidelines. That means we do not discuss any non-public information for publicly traded companies. We do not talk about territories, prices, and embargoes. We can talk about public information, and that's what we're interested in here, is educating the market about graphene enhanced materials or functionalized materials. So I just want to make you aware that we take these obligations seriously and ask you to read these regulations as they apply to any meeting convened by the Graphene Council or by our members, whether we're there or not. The Graphene Council was founded in 2013 and is by far the largest trade and professional body for the graphene sector. We reach more than 27,000 material scientists that are in the production side, supply side, or end user side of this material, including academic researchers and commercial users. The Graphene Council represents, as I mentioned, the entire value chain. We're very proud to have the academic and university community with us. Uh, of course, the University of Manchester and the Graphene Engineering and Innovation Center. We also have graphite mining companies, graphene producers, intermediary companies, and end user companies such as the Ford Motor Company. We continue to add members because of the demand and the advancement of commercialization of graphene materials. And if your organization is not yet a member, we encourage you to consider joining. Why would you join? Well, first of all, is to have access to this global network. We also produce a weekly graphene intelligence briefing that covers commercial developments, research developments, and patent filings worldwide for graphene. And we also provide our organizational members with a graphene report that is more than 600 pages covering production methodologies, commercial forms of material, market pricing information, application data, patent review, and includes a profile of more than 200 graphene producing companies. So let's get into this. Now, graphene by itself is already an amazing material. Graphene can be incorporated into a wide range of host materials, can be used as coatings, can be used as sensors. There's just an almost endless array of applications for the material. But what we see is that uh, graphene is produced in uh, multiple uh, methods. So typically it's exfoliated from graphite. That's one route, the top-down methodology or it can be from a carbon bearing uh, precursor like a methane gas in using the CBD process. It can be a bottom up process, atom by atom uh, formation of crystals. And there are other production methodologies including uh, detonation and, and other forms of producing graphene. So there's many ways of producing this material, but of course these different ways of producing material produce different types of graphene materials. Now, these vary widely either by the number of layers. So technically graphene is one layer, but when we talk about commercially available forms of graphene materials, you can have multi-layer material that's one, two, three, five, ten 10 different layers of carbon. And you can also get formats such as graphene oxide or reduced graphene oxide, which can have uh, 35 to 40% oxygen content, varying down to five or 7% oxygen content. And of course, you can have other species, which is what we're going to talk about in our enhancement and functionalization uh, discussion today. So graphene can be functionalized, which is the technical term for what we do, but it's really enhancing graphene, modifying it uh, in order to improve certain attributes of it. So it can either be to enhance uh, existing attributes like strength, electrical conductivity, et cetera, or it can be to modify it to add attributes that it doesn't have. And this would be by adding uh, atoms, molecules, or different species, either to the surface of the material or to the edges of both. And we might do that to enhance its uh, solubility into a solvent, for example, or to make it more adhesive within a composite matrix. So there's different reasons for doing it. And this is a, another way of enhancing this material. And frankly, for the material scientists out there and for the engineers, I think this is important to understand that this gives you yet another tool in the toolbox to use this amazing material 
and to tune it for specific applications. And that's, that's what's important here. And this, this function can be done by graphene producers that have this capability or where we're going to look at two companies that actually specialize in this process alone. Um, and now that, that's what we're going to get to next. So how and why to functionalize graphene materials is what we're going to talk about. And I'm really pleased to have the expertise of Kevin Keith from Mito Materials, uh, which is a relatively young company. Um, and then Haydale, which is a company well known within the graphene world for its leadership position that it's taken over the many years um, that have really perfected this. And both of these companies are unique in the sense that they don't actually produce graphene materials themselves. Instead, they, they source graphene and then they uh, toll process it, uh, doing a modification of the material to make it suited for a particular application. And I think that makes them quite unique and quite valuable partners in the entire value chain of, uh, of graphene materials from production to end use. So we're gonna hear from both of them about how they do this. So Kevin, if you're online, if you're unmuted and you're ready to go and, and uh, can share your screen, we'll, we'll hear from you first. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Kevin Keith. I am the head of product at Mito Material Solutions to where uh, we, we functionalize graphene oxide to give it a bunch of uh, different variations and uh, applications that we don't usually see in the marketplace. So Mito Materials, a little background is we've been in operation for about four years right now. Uh, we have about three mil $3 million in funding, uh, both non-dilutive and uh, series funding uh, from the likes of NASA, NSF, SBIR, Phase 1 and 2. And we recently just closed a funding round uh, with uh, Clean Energy Trust and Apollo leading. Um, we also went through a Techstars Accelerator uh, as of 2019, and we are seven employees across two different states, uh, Oklahoma and Stillwater, and Indianapolis, Indiana. So at Mino Materials, uh, we functionalize graphene oxide and we graft it to POS, which is an organic inorganic molecule called polyoligoheric cisocleoxane. Uh, with this combination, we're able to make products 135% stronger, 35% lighter, and we don't change manufacturing processes. Uh, we, we mainly focus on fiber reinforced polymers, so whether it's thermosets or thermoplastics. Uh, we work at a 0.1% by weight concentration and it does not agglomerate. So standard personal protection equipment is uh, sufficient enough to handle our product to integrate it, considering our particle size is anywhere between 4 and 27 microns. And so what we do in-house is, like Terrence said, we don't make graphene or graphene oxide. We source it and then we functionalize it. So right now we're using a trade secret single batch process. Uh, to where we graft different types of amines to the graphene oxide, and then we graft uh, an epoxide POS currently. So the, the POS structure is that central cage uh, silicone dioxide structure, and then you have your polymer arms, which could be swapped out for uh, epoxides or acrylates or methylacrylates, you name it. And so because of this, it is an extremely versatile product and method that we are doing. Uh, where we can control that D space in between the graphing platelets. So depending on what amine we put in there, we can either have a very small uh, D spacing or we can have very, very large to where we can quadruple or quintuple that working surface area. And so the process that we've developed is, uh, has a very, very high output to where we can make commercial quantities of this since a little goes a long ways. And so looking at different types of functionalizations out there, you have covalent, non-covalent, you even have element doping to where you can put boron, phosphorus, or uh, nitrogen on there to change band gaps and structures and all that stuff for different electrical conductivity properties. But what we mainly do at Mito right now is covalent functionalization. So what we do is we utilize the, the carboxyl groups with the amines, uh, really gives us extra functionalization points and we're playing around right now with incorporating both covalent and non-covalent uh, with some ionic bonding within our original product, EGO. So EGO is a combination of that epoxide POS and the graphene oxide. And so instead of focusing our products on automotive, aerospace, sporting goods, things like that, we decided to take a step back and try to make it uh, a more collaborative, simpler to try to integrate our product. So with EGO, we really focus on increased flex and compressive properties uh, while 
of increasing that adherence between the fiber and the polymer. So with Ego, we really focus on the fiber reinforced polyester, epoxy, and nylon, so like PA66. Uh, we, we've managed to unlock some, some really great potential with polyester products, uh, albeit it's a cheaper material, but I'll show later in the presentation that we've seen some really, really great performance enhancements that really justify uh, the integration and the cost of added a new product. So the improvements we've seen within Ego, uh, we've seen a flex modulus increase of 58%, a compressive load per inch of 43%, both within fiberglass and polyester. Uh, we've also done some studies within carbon fiber and prepreg epoxy from TCR that we've seen a G1C increase of 74%. And any day now, we're waiting for more extensive uh, fiber reinforced nylon results to come in. So fingers crossed that'll be this week. And currently we are, we have a couple of different variations coming down the pipeline. Uh, a couple of them, we're, we're swapping out the graphene oxide and experimenting with some biofeed stock to see what we can come up with. But one very promising additive that we have coming is what we call Ego. So what we do is since our, pro our process is very versatile, we can swap out that epoxide POS for an acrylate POS. So instead of just utilizing the basal plane of the graphene oxide, we're able to utilize the whole bonding plane of the graphene oxide. So that means we can uh, blow that D-spacing open even more, have even more bonding points. And this Ego version, we're really focusing on acrylate-based adhesives, uh, bonding dissimilar materials, like materials, and even coatings. So like uh, bonding composite panels to an aluminum car frame, for instance. Uh, we have some people piloting this product, some beta testing, some product iteration, and it's going really great so far. And so focusing on purely ego, uh, essentially it's boiling down to three application points. Durability, we have people looking to transition uh, from metals or even other lesser polymers to uh, more advanced composites to make them uh, have a larger, longer fatigue life, uh, higher impact, that sort of thing. We actually have somebody that is uh, testing our product within a uh, gear system to transition their products from metal gears to thermoplastic gears within the transmission case. Uh, we also have some people that are testing our product to uh, focus on light weighting. So we have a, a freight trailer manufacturer that is uh, looking to transition from steel composites to uh, fiber reinforced composites. And uh, we're, we just entered in a really extensive testing phase with them to qualify our product within their, their trailers in the next 12 months. And we also have some people that are focusing on epoxy coatings, uh, specifically epoxy powder coatings uh, for anti-corrosive properties because we've seen some, some really great results with uh, our Ego product being able to increase that anti-corrosion resistance. And so looking at the, the freight trailer use case, uh, they're really wanting to shed 40 to 50% of their original weight, uh, which is going to result in 40% reduction in admissions from semi-trailers. But the kicker is they need the same load capacity. And so whenever we, we integrated into polyester, uh, it, it was an interplastics resin, uh, kind of a complicated fiberglass system that they use. Uh, but it was a hand layup process for moving on to vacuum infusion. Uh, just because we've seen that our, our Ego product, it can be used in any manufacturing method, whether it's hand layup, infusion, or even pultrusion. Uh, we don't see any filtration, which is really, really great. So uh, within this polyester results, uh, we've seen no degradations, uh, but we saw some very large improvements, uh, including the flex modulus going up 58% and the flex load per inch up 43%. And so comparing the, the fiberglass and polyester with Mito inside of it to their neat vinyl ester, we saw that we were able to take a, a much cheaper material and boost it way beyond uh, what vinyl ester is able to accomplish. So using the same fiberglass, the, the same amount of layers, we were able to produce results 135% above vinyl ester. So this goes to show that we've been able to take cheaper materials, really focus on the forgotten people, right? Uh, 
making sure that we can produce something to make it more applicable to everybody else. And we've seen that within a pre-preg carbon fiber with a TCR epoxy, uh, which is a mix of a BPA and a BPF. Uh, we, use, we applied this within a PVP carrier, so within a, a spray application, uh, just because we didn't have the means to compound down the epoxy ourselves. So looking at the, the neat carbon fiber as compared to the carbon fiber with mito in it, we saw a G1C increase of 74%. So to get these results, a double, double cantilever beam test was performed with the Teflon sheet in the middle. Uh, and so this shows that we can really produce a really, really great results with very little application, time, effort. And because of that, we can see that this functionalization really, really does work. And so, first of all, thank you, Terrence, for inviting us to do this presentation. We really appreciate it. We are a fairly young company, but we have a lot of potential ahead of us. And so what we are definitely wanting to do with this platform is we really, really want to enable the, the industry to adopt this cutting edge material because John Mark is going to tell you some really, really great information about uh, functionalized graphene oxide, its applications, and how really us banding together and educating can push the composites industry forward more than before. Excellent. Kevin, th thank you so much. Yeah. And I appreciate, you know, the use of data and the, the straightforward approach. You know, we want people to understand, you know, obviously you're a commercial company mm -hmm. and, and we want to encourage people to adopt it. But, you know, th this is based on, on um, some solid data and the percentage improvements are quite impressive, as well as the fact that I, I always try to reiterate this. People uh, look at uh, graphene as an expensive material, but yep. uh, if I remember correctly in your, in your slides, you're talking about tenth, one tenth of 1% by weight loading. Is that correct? That is correct. So with two pounds of our product, you can make uh, enough epoxy for 3,000 carbon fiber bike frames or enough plastic parts for five Ford F-150s. Well, so, there you go. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, that's... The, Best examples that we've been able to come up with because it can go across so many different industries. Uh, it really is effortless to compound in. Uh, with that nylon 6.6 data coming in, we were able to just use a double hopper system, uh, put the pellets in one hopper, the powder in the other, and it compounded beautifully and dispersed very, very well. So Excellent. Excellent. even though it starts off at a, a micron size, it compounds down to a, a nanometer size. Excellent. Well, thank you. And we'll be back to you for Q&A after John Mark's presentation. So John Mark, if you're ready and you're able to share your screen, we'd love to hear from Haydale and, and what you guys have been doing because you've been, you've been at this for a while and have really um, some, some amazing uh, experience to share. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, thanks, uh, Kevin, for that. It was a great presentation. And thanks, Terrence, for the opportunity to present to everybody here. Um, so just a little bit about Haydale then. So, hey Dale, we've got five locations around the world. We've got 11 of our reactors that we use to functionalize nanomaterials. Uh, we've got 50 staff. Uh, we floated on the London uh, AIM listed in 2014, and that enabled us to have this global reach that we want to provide to our customers um, in our solutions. So, hey Dale's core focus is a solutions provider. We look at end product uplifts and work our way backwards. Now, the key that we found to getting graphene to work is this functionalization, what today's all about. So one of my favorite images here, you can see in the bottom right corner there, we've got a standard epoxy with no filler, and then we've got an epoxy there with non-functionalized carbon nanotubes, for an example. Uh, we've also got those two vials, which I'll get to in a bit, but you can see untreated uh, few layered graphene on one side and treated on the other. So when most uh, industries, they hear about graphene, they get all excited, you know, more conductive than copper, stronger than steel. They'll purchase some of this stuff off the shelf and try, powder, try uh, utilize it in its powdered form. And what they'll often see is that uh, small disc there on the bottom left. The powder's agglomerated, it's not fully dispersed, um, and they won't see any of the uplifts. If anything, they've just added impurities to the product. Now, they can realize the potential of graphene, usually through some uh, high shear mixing that can take several days, uh, adding a lot of surfactants and these sorts of chemistries. 
But that disc there on the right has got functionalized carbon nanotubes, the same fill percent, and it's just been mixed through by hand. No uh, high shear, no surfactant. And that's the benefit you can see straight away. The material is fully dispersed, and you can start to utilize the potential of these nanomaterials. Now, how we do it at Haydale, uh, it's a bit of a different method to uh, Kevin there, but it's the same functionalization. So we use plasma functionalization. So what we end up doing when we get approached by our customers, we work back from what they're looking for. So if they're looking for mechanical uplifts, electrical uplifts, uh, trying to use recycled materials, we see what their application is and we work back. So we can then select in the first stage what raw material they want. So we can select different types of carbon, graphenes, GMPs, you know, uh, graphene nanoplatelets, few layered graphenes. And then with our plasma system, we can choose the right surface chemistry. So we can check what's the matrix it's gonna go into. We can matrix match the material. And we can use also other chemistries that provide hydrophobicity, um, improved conductivity, and that sort of thing as well. With our plasma reactors, we're also able to control the level of functionalization. Um, so in that image there, you can see some of our HT60 plasma reactors. These are our lab scale plasma reactors. So when we're developing a new product for a customer, we often start with those machines. And um, what we do have available as well is a HD200, 200 liter machine. Uh, we have available a 1400 and a 4000 liter machine. Customers weren't, so this is focused on large markets, um, global supply and uh, that sort of thing as well. So uh, a bit about our, our process here. So with the plasma functionalization, you can see in that image there, this is the HD60 lab scale machine. We have a uh, reaction barrel that we load the nanomaterials into. Again, whatever one we select for the, for the process, we can treat components, we can functionalize non-graphene materials as well that's needed. Um, we load it into that barrel, we slide the barrel into the plasma reactor, uh, shut the door, uh, we vac it, vac it down to um, the needed pressures, and then we can bleed into the process chemistry that we need. Once the atmosphere inside the barrel is all set, we strike the plasma and we treat the surface for a set amount of time. So that results, as you can see there, oxygen groups uh, 4 to 28 uh, percent, ammonia group, groups 2 to 8 percent. Uh, we can do hybrid functionalization, so we can mix them, so you have the improved dispersion as well as the improved product, the particle uplifts. And we've got uh, patent coverage, and it's mentioned there again the different material types we can do, ceramics, uh, carbons, all these sorts of things, and our process is scaled as well. Um, one thing there about Haydale, because we're a global company, we can source several types of materials from several supply chains to ensure that our customer can always have the same uh, product at the end of the day. Um, it's also cost effective, so we supply from this site here where I'm based in South Wales to Asia um, as well, and it's environmentally friendly, which is key in this day and age. Uh, our process is non-destructive and pristine. And we've also got third-party verification for MPO, which I'll share a bit of data for uh, in a bit. It's quite interesting because some people are quite nervous about uh, functionalization as a whole, especially plasma functionalization can seem a bit novel and challenging. We've been doing this now for seven years. Uh, plasma industry has been around for a lot longer than that. We're just taking it next level. Uh, we've got worldwide patent protection in our uh, process. And again, like I said, our process is custom, customizable and um, we can enhance the matrix interactions. So just a bit of a quick video here, uh, pictures speak a thousand words. So again, you can see uh, in the top uh, left there, untreated material and uh, our plasma functionalized material, how it sediments after three hours. Um, and then again, you can see some of the nice uh, videos there of dispersing. So, a bit about functionalization. Um, this is a, a study that we did with the uh, National Physics Laboratory in London. So they're a uh, flagship scientific uh, institute based in England. Um, so we've done two tests here. First one there on the left is our nitrogen functionalization. So we've taken two types of few layered graphenes. And you can see there when we do a low or a medium or a high treatment, the increasing of the um, atomic weight there. Same with our oxygen treatments. But you can see there for the keen eyed that one of the FLG starts to dip down as we've increased the treatment level. So this is sort of increasing the, the power, if you would, the effect of the treatment. 
Now that we've noticed that that dip down is actually generated in different types of side groups. So again, we can be, manipulate this process to get different types of acidic or hydroxyl groups if needed. Um, another example here is uh, surface chemistry changes by zeta potential. Um, so we've got two materials here. We've got a graphene nanoplatelet and a few layered graphene. So we've taken the raw material and we functionalized it. This data here, it shows that um, we can change and tune the surface chemistry and thus matching the powder to whatever required matrix of polymer or liquid we're trying to achieve as well. So this little infographic here um, talks about what sort of markets you can get into. So without functionalization, um, you can't really apply nanomaterials cost effectively to these sorts of markets. So remember that image there of the three disks? You'll end up with these sorts of sedimentation or high costs in your process when you're trying to uh, achieve it. One of our product ranges is composites. So we've got um, an existing pre-preg product range. We have uh, a mechanically enhanced pre-preg, electrically and thermal. So where functionalization comes into this, if you take, for example, the mechanically enhanced pre-preg, if your nanomaterials is not fully um, interacting correctly in the matrix, if the graphene is extremely pristine, you'll end up getting sort of an almost delamination or a sedimentation in your process. So one uh, story I like to draw on is in the composites industry, which has been around for decades. But at the start of that technology, they had some issues with delamination. So that's the, the fiber, the glass or carbon fibers was delaminating from the uh, resin systems they were using. Uh, after a while of development, they developed sizing to coat the fibers and that improved uh, the adhesion and they didn't get delamination. It's very similar to functionalization. So once we can functionalize the surface with the right surface chemistries, then it will interact correctly in the matrix. And that's when we really start to unlock graphene and start to see the improvements there for mechanical. Same works for electrical and thermal. If your nanomaterial is not fully dispersed into the matrix or sediments out, you're not gonna get all that uh, particle to particle contact and that improved sort of uh, conductivity across the board. And that's sometimes the graphene curse. Someone takes some graphene, buys even some expensive stuff, but it's too pristine and pure. It hasn't got that surface chemistry. Um, a bit of a case study here, BAC Mono, the world's uh, first road legal single seat graphene enhanced uh, racing car. Uh, this is a production car as well. Um, so we've used our mechanical prepreg to give you weight savings and mechanical strength. And we've also done our thermally enhanced prepreg for the uh, higher throughput for auto, uh, the automotive industry. And that also improves the surface finish and the visual panel parts. Um, so again, on the mechanicals here, so with the functionalization, you see increased fracture toughness, increased impact strength, um, and then and all these other benefits you can see. Uh, another good visual image here is the uh, conductive um, prepreg. Uh, this has been developed for lightning strike. So you can see the standard epoxy control there with the damage done by the uh, simulated lightning strike compared to our version there on the, on the right. Now, this has been to de developed to replace the sort of uh, metallic mesh used in, in this industry, which is quite uh, laborious to produce and uh, implement into aircraft and quite expensive as well. Um, one thing I'd like to share in this is if you see that chart there on the bottom right, and um, you can see that as Haydale's developed the technology, we were able to select different material types and improve the functionalization to ensure that we get that conductivity and that dispersion we needed. So if you just took a standard off the shelf graphene, you'll be towards the left of it. But as we work and tune our technology and find out what chemistries are needed and what materials, we're able to achieve the performance that's uh, cost effective. And this applies for our inks and coatings. So at Haydale, we've got a range of different inks. We've got functionalized uh, carbon inks, which are normalized to about eight ohms. Uh, square. We've got silver hybrid inks as well. Um, we've got uh, flexible heater uh, technology, wearables. Um, we've also got piezo-resistive uh, graphene inks. So again, these are all unlocked um, and made scalable and cost-effective due to our functionalization process. Uh, this is a bit of a sort of a working example of our uh, technology that's come out of our plasma reactors. 
And we took some standard carbon black, some recovered carbon black, and we were developing an ink out of it. So in our first uh, iteration with the raw, uh, untreated carbon blacks, we saw uh, 140 ohms in the product. All we did is we took that carbon black, put it in the reactor, treated it for about an hour uh, with the right surface chemistries that we wanted to, again, we're trying to improve the dispersion of the material, as well as improving surface chemistries that uh, aid in conductivity. When we did that, when we applied that technology, we saw this, we went from 140 ohms to 40 ohms in, in the process. So that's the sort of technology that we're applying to all of the product ranges and all of our customers there. Uh, another good example here, so we're talking about improving dispersion and improving the matrix interaction, but with surface chemistry, you can improve or change the way the material behaves. So this is uh, one of our uh, hydrophobic coatings. So we've got three images at the bottom of that slide. So the one on the far left is the unfilled epoxy resin uh, with a contact angle there. So potentially a customer would take that, get some graphene because it's supposed to have some sort of surface uh, anti-corrosion, uh, hydrophobic properties, and they'll apply it to the, the matrix. They'll see an improvement, but it's not enough for them to take the uh, commercial uh, product further. But if we can functionalize the material there and um, with the right hydro, uh, hydrophobic properties, then you can see a large change there. Um, and again, the picture speaks a thousand words. So here's a video uh, of, a, of a standard graphene field coating and then I've treated with our hydrophobic surface treatment uh, on the graphene there as well. Um, elastomers as well. So this is, um, we've uh, doing F1 engine mounts with our functionalized material. So um, by applying a functionalized nanomaterial, it's stronger, tougher, more uh, tear resistance. Uh, it offers more higher uh, load bearing capabilities. Um, and all the other um, specifics there are maintained. So this is a good slide here to demonstrate the benefits of functionalization, right? So in the bottom right of that screen, you can see um, the, the effect of unfunctionalized nanomaterial and functionalized material as well. Um, so that's improving the performance of the nanomaterials and again, making it more um, uh, applicable to the industry and um, the commercials of it. So a bit of a summary there. Uh, Haydale can produce a wide range of functionalized uh, materials such as high treated oxygen up to 28%. Uh, we can produce pure functionalization with no trap elements such as sulfur. Our process is environmentally friendly with no downstream effluent streams. Um, we've got a hybrid functionalization so we can also improve the dispersion and the matrix interaction as well as giving the nanomaterials other benefits. Um, our process is scalable, we've got reactors around the world, um, and it's also cost effective. Now, our process is patented around the world, and um, we've uh, evaluated, measured, and characterized over 250 uh, graphene family nanomaterials. Um, and just, just summarizing there as well, that's, that image there of the epoxy is one of my favorites there. I, I take these discs around me. If you've ever heard me talk before, I'll carry them around. Um, our team here, Taking those 250 types of materials, we essentially are applying what you see in that image to all of these technologies to fully unlock uh, the potential of nanomaterials. Okay. Excellent, John Mark. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And obviously, we'll um, we'll share the contact details for each of you with uh, with our uh, with our audience so that they can uh, get in touch with you. So for those of you watching and, and uh, paying attention to today's, today's webinar, if you have any questions for either of the presenters, please use the Q&A uh, dialog box to, to post your questions. And in the meantime, we'll go ahead with the questions we have. And the first one, I'll go to you, Kevin. Um, yeah. The question is, were, was there any, um, any study or performance figures about uh, your ego product on electro uh, electromagnetic performance. So we've seen uh, graphene a lot for EMI shielding and that sort of thing. And I assume that's mm -hmm. what they're interested in. Yeah. So <clears throat> electromagnetic, no, we haven't done anything uh, for that yet. So being a, a younger company, right, we've been mainly focusing on mechanical properties. Now, of course, there's a long list that we want to test. Uh, so we're definitely looking for those right customers that come along and help steer us in those, you know, tests. Uh, we have done resistance 
testing. Uh, we've done some conductivity testing with an EPON828 and carbon fiber reinforcement. And we saw that uh, on the surface conductivity and the volumetric conductivity, we decreased it by 86 and 68% respectively. Mm -hmm. So there's something there. Um, being our process, being very versatile, I'm sure there's a way that we can figure something out. Excellent. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, there's a question I think we could have anticipated um, uh, before doing this webinar about cost, right? So mm -hmm. obviously we have graphene as a material that's supplied by a graphene producer, and then we're going to add this process to it, which, you know, obviously adds a level of cost. Is there any way you guys can address, you know, the, the cost perspective? And I'd like you to um, to address it from one is um, obviously you need to be paid for your services, your expertise and the manipulation of the product. But the second is, you know, how does this tie into the overall value proposition of the end use? Because at the end of the day, what really matters is what is the performance improvement versus the cost to get there, whether it's through functionalization or otherwise. So um, I don't know which of you would like to tackle that one first. Yeah, so, so with, our, with our, I can speak on behalf of our plasma functionalization process and probably all, all processes. Um, the, the key to this is being able to scale it up. So with a small lab scale HD60 machine, the batch size is quite low. And when that machine is actually running and operating, it uses in sometimes less power than a kettle. So the running costs of the system are quite low. It's just the handling of loading and unloading the system. And with our larger machines up to the 4,000 liter machine, that's when you really start to see that the cost impact of, is being negligible to the uplift of the process there as well. Um, again, you're only changing the surface chemistry. I think what we've also seen uh, from uh, Kevin's process is there is we're really looking at the end product uplifts. And that is, you know, at Haydale, we see what the customer wants, what's their application, what's their improvements. And sometimes they don't even ask us about the functionalization. They just say, okay, we want to see this result or this mechanical improvement. And we work for, through them to find a solution. Excellent. Kevin? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're in that same boat, right? So uh, we are producing commercial scales right now. Um, we, are, we are definitely looking for the right partner to come along uh, and kind of testing within their system, making sure that we can provide the, the benefit uh, to justify this sort of material, right? So um, while we're, we're fortifying our supply chain and making sure that we can definitely cut costs where we can and make sure that we can provide the value uh, for the customer, uh, it, it is definitely something that we are looking at. And we definitely, we're sticking to a, a certain product portfolio and we're really, really trying to stay away from custom formalization. Yeah, uh, you know, for my, my two cents on this, uh, on this aspect, one is um, if you can prevent failure, right? Mm -hmm. So through functionalization that you get an effective dispersion, um, that's quite important. I think the other thing that's happened just as an observation over the past years is we've seen folks that were doing, you know, a 5% load factor, then a 1% load factor, then a tenth of a percent load factor, then into the hundreds of a percent load factor. And I think we all would agree, and, and, and if, you, if, you, if you have a different opinion or a different aspect, please share it. But, you know, if you get a better dispersion, it means you can actually use less of the material typically and still get an improved performance. So that really mitigates uh, some of that cost. And um, the other aspect I don't think we've touched on is the fact that you're using so little of this additive material, you're getting all of the benefit of the host material, right? You're not sacrificing like with a carbon black, you have to sacrifice your host material. So I think that's interesting. And the other aspect from a cost one is if you're able to incorporate this into an existing industrial process. So you don't need a different process step. You don't need to modify how you're making your product. You don't need capital equipment. Um, that also mitigates against this cost uh, versus maybe some alternative solutions. Is that, do you guys share yeah, that? That's that exactly it. What one yeah. of the um, product lines or the product offerings we have at Haydale is what we call a master batch. So essentially, uh, in the co uh, composites industry, the customer will be already using a, a, a resin system, and they'll provide that or a component of that to us, um, and then we will fill it as high as possible to ensure it's still workable with the nanomaterials. So we can get it, you know, maybe 40% or 10% fill of that material, ship it to the customer, and then they can dilute it down to the levels that they need at their process with no sort of uh, line system changes or anything like that. Uh, again, the cost just goes down and down as you dilute it in, into the process as well. 
Excellent. Thank you. Exactly. So another question, especially I propose for today's environment with COVID and, and the focus on what we can do um, with advanced materials to mitigate uh, some, some health issues is uh, what, what about with biosensors? Have, have you seen interest or work um, in that side with, uh, with biosensors and graphene material? Yeah, so, so at, at Haydale, we've, uh, I've actually probably got a sample here of a uh, blood glucose sensor, so a, a biosensor that we've manufactured in the past. So the benefit there for the, the graphene application with that was replacing the silver inks, okay? So that was simply we're trying to reduce costs and uh, open up the market to more industries there. Um, so the print, print electronics and biosensors, um, there's the sort of the, the line and the conductivity side of things as well. Um, but then obviously the, the graphene in the surface area has, um, there's definitely potential there for, for more novel um, uh, sort of on the chemical sensor side of thing as well. Um, we at Haydale have been focusing on the cost savings, replacing silvers as I mentioned, um, but as the technology moves forward and what functionalization we can put on the surface, there's a, there's a huge potential there for this industry. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Kevin, do you have anything to add on that side? Or? Uh, uh, I have a much shorter answer. Uh, no, we haven't <laughs> done anything for biosensors yet. Uh, but we did found uh, back in March uh, using a different type of amine that had a bunch of primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, bonding points to try to figure out a more hydrophobic uh, antibacterial coating um, to apply it to paper. Uh, I saw in the newsletter probably a month or two back there was already somebody much bigger than us already working on that so we kind of killed that project off and we continued forward with ego and ego yeah well in the for what it's worth column you know the the the, the beauty of graphene is that there are so many potential applications and the yes. the challenges there are so you know you can really end up chasing squirrels so to say mm -hmm. um, going after so many different applications yeah, and it's crazy too because you don't have to just stick to covalent bonding and using those amines. You can get different properties by choosing different solvents to functionalize in. So if you're using THF or something like that, you can get uh, enhanced uh, dispersibility. But if you switch to IPA, that's slightly different. You can get uh, increased toughness or conductivity, that sort of thing. So it, it's a, a very much a waterfall system. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I've just seen here some, some examples as uh, demonstrators of some sensors we have here at Haydale. We've already got a line of inks that we're developing for the, the biosensor market. Um, but then our, our USP as Haydale as a business is either if the customer wants working towards a final solution or working with them on the existing product with functionalization to help reduce the cost there of that product as well. Again, the key is functionalization. Otherwise, you're just adding, you know, high fill of graphene and a lot of downstream mixing for it as well. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question about the types of functionalization that can be done, and one is about fluorination. So if you can put mm -hmm. the, you know, some fluoride compounds on there. So um, Kevin, you're shaking your head, yes. So it's possible we haven't done it in our lab just yet. So. Okay. Um, it's possibly something coming up in the next couple of years, but it's definitely it, somewhat on our radar right now. Okay. And John Mark? Yeah, we, we, we do offer that chemistry to the surface. Um, again, we usually focus on what the customer is looking for before we get uh, So we've measured fl yeah. fluorine groups in the surface through XPS, but if the customer is asking for hydrophobicity, then we work on that measure for success. And we try then, because sometimes it's not just the fluorinization of the surface, we want to add other chemical groups to ensure it's fully dispersed. Um, but that's something we've got there as well. Excellent. So I have a question for both of you and um, curious to get your answer. So the question from one of our, one of our participants is, you know, could they send you a material, uh, like a, a small amount, but on a toll processing basis, and um, they did ask, you know, what that would cost. I'm not going to ask you to answer that because we're not going to discuss prices here. Um, that's something I would encourage them to reach out to you directly on. But this is a real issue. You know, it, it was with, uh, with graphene. And, and, and again, the Graphene Council has been active in this sector now since 2013. And we've seen at the beginning, graphene companies were just giving anybody who would ask, here's a sample material and go on your way. And they were spending a lot of time chasing these uh, queries. Um, I think it's matured quite a bit, and I think we've gotten beyond where, you know, people are just handing out free samples um, and, and that sort of thing, and it's more serious. So, so the real question is, 
um, you know, if somebody comes to you and they just want to kind of experiment around, is that something you're, you're, you're really set up to spend time on or do you need projects that are a little bit uh, further along the development cycle? So the, there's, there's two aspects there. We'd be happy to help uh, universities and that sort of thing develop the technology. I think everybody in this, in this uh, event today is keen to sort of get graphene working. So mm -hmm. we'll be definitely there to help support R&D. Um, but again, we like to focus and find out what they're actually trying to achieve. So if a, if a customer says to us, oh, can you treat this and send it back? We would usually ask, you know, what are you trying to achieve? What are you looking for? That infographic we had and the one behind me here is we're looking at the end application. This, this is all the IP on the functionalization. You almost don't need to worry about that when we're looking at what the end product is. Um, also in that question, you're talking about toll manufacturing and treating powder. Um, with our plasma process and our reactors and I think any sort of functionalization process, if we can work with the customer to find out what the end result is and the end process, sure, we can then work on either them sending material for toll manufacturing, we functionalize it and send it off. We've also got uh, reactors around the world. Again, it's looking at that making it work for all parties. There's no point trying to be difficult on the process there. Yeah. We want to find out what they're trying to achieve, what their volumes are, what's the study, and then we can work with them on that. I, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, uh, we're in that same boat. So we, we haven't been approached with that question just yet about uh, helping universities or PhDs functionalize their material to see what it could do. Um, everything that we use is, uh, I want to say pretty standard, but uh, everything that is in-house right now is not on a, a large, large scale. So we already toll manufacture, right? So we contract out, they have the capabilities of making 125 kilograms at a time. So we don't have to spend a million dollars on equipment. So um, that is a very interesting question. Um, I'd have to consider it, but on John Mark's point, we're, we're definitely looking to collaborate with the industry and what us at Mido, the, the big goal for us is almost creating an open source database of how functionalized graphene could work in different materials. That way you could go to a, a standard website, kind of say, oh, what would it perform like in PA66 with 30% fiber loading? And it will pull up all that data to streamline this adoption process. Right. Yeah. Well, I think you're both on the right track with really understanding what the end customer is trying to achieve, what processes they use, et cetera. And, and the, the other amazing thing about graphene that's happened and we've seen multiple times is that, you know, the customer maybe is looking for a particular aspect, like let's say impact resistance for a, a, a part. And they find mm -hmm. that graphene has actually delivered some additional benefits that they didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. But that can happen if you're really working closely with them and you understand what they're trying to achieve. Um, is they can probably get more benefit out of it than they anticipate going into it. Um, Kevin, for you specifically, there's a question about the, um, the influence of the despacing that you mentioned on the mechanical properties. Can you just talk a little bit about what, what is actually happening there? What's, what's influencing that mechanical improvement? Yeah, so the despacing kind of plays into a couple of different properties. So we see that the, the increased despacing improves the dispersibility of the product. Uh, we also see that it increases the working surface area, so you have a lot more bonding points. So say like you have a, a five-layer graphene oxide particle. Uh, you, usually, if, if you have it suspended in water, you can't really put that in any sort of organic system. And as soon as you dry out that water, despacing collapses, it becomes rock hard. You essentially can't disperse it, and it only has the top and bottom working layer. Uh, once you incorporate that despacing and you keep it blown open just enough, dispersibility is great and then you also have the top and bottom surface area of all five of those graphene oxide layers that way you take something say each layer is 200 square meters per gram you turn that into a thousand so it really helps promote the the chemical and physical bonding points of that product excellent thank you for that yeah and for john mark there's a question specifically just uh you know we're, we're not going to get into a um uh, an academic lesson on it, but somebody wanted to have a little little explanation about you know the the, the art of uh, plasma functionalization. What it, you know the the function of uh, the plasma reactor. Can you just talk about you know the the underpinning of what ha what's happening there? Yeah. So so it, to keep it short, I mean it's quite uh, quite a novel process there. Um, plasma treatment and plasma corona treatments have been used in industry and widely adopted for surface cleaning. 
of the process. Um, it's used before adhesion, it's used in automotive and that, those sorts of industries. And um, with us though, we fine tuned our process so that it doesn't etch away and damage the surface, but it also does more than just clean. So when we uh, get all of the parameters correct and strike, uh, right, we strike the plasma, what seems to happen is the molecules start to disassociate, right? And then, um, and then this is where it starts to become a, a bit of a dark art. And um, these energized uh, nano, these energized uh, molecules then bombard the surface of the graphene. And it's through that process with uh, fine tuning that we start to see the covalent bonding on the surface. Um, and there's a lot in our team here and our uh, specialists in the shop floor that understand the process a lot more than me. But it's still quite novel and still quite uh, exciting. And that's why we work very closely with the MPL there, trying to understand the full mechanics of that process. Um, and again, we always look at the end product and the uplifts we see at the end of the process and work our way back because it can get quite confusing when you're trying to understand plasma physics at the same time. Excellent. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, I have just two more questions and I think we'll have to call it um, at that. And the additional questions that uh, we won't get to, we are going to try to get you written responses for those who pose those questions. So the first question for each of you, um, I, I want to understand what is the impact of the quality and quality is a subjective uh, term when we come to when we talk about graphene materials but what is the impact on the nature and the type of the input material you get how big an influence is that on on the end product for functionalization and Kevin why don't you you start with that one yeah so that is a great question um, so ideally with graphene and graphene oxide you want as few layers as possible now the fewer the layers, the more expensive it is. So there's definitely a, a cost benefit that you have to do. We usually aim for anywhere between two and five uh, on average. So, and then depending on what functionalization method the distributor used, you could have a higher or lower sulfur content. So uh, as of right now, we're working with a graphene oxide that has a two to 4% sulfur content. Um, and that really does affect uh, the, the grafting points of the graphene oxide. So whenever we're synthesizing the amine to it and then the POS, it really does affect it to a certain degree. Um, so it, you do have to pick and choose what you're using. Uh, graphene oxide, uh, I wouldn't say more or less is all the same, but there are definitely nuances to it that could cascade further and further into your end product. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. And John Mark, how would you address this one briefly? Yeah, so, so the question there is about uh, functionalization and quality. So, so for me then, I think there's a, there's a we used to have a, a, a diagram of a pyramid, the benefits of, of functionalization. Um, at the bottom of the pyramid, it just aids dispersion. It just allows you to unlock and use the material. Without mm -hmm. that dispersion, you're adding impurities and often it's just unviable to be used in there. Uh, the second sort of tier of the of the pyramid, you could say, would be that quality. Because it's a full uh, homogeneous dispersion throughout your process, you, you know exactly what levels of surface chemistry you're getting on there, then you start to see that repeatability and quality. And what we also start to see as you go up the pyramid is sort of cost savings as well, because it's functionalized and fully dispersed, uh, you get, and, and you get, yes, less uh, failure rates, and you also get a better, you know, those secondary benefits too from it as well. And then towards the top of the pyramid, some of the more novel applications you can have of it as well. Well, so let they, me, let, sorry, Joe Mark, let me, let me ask the question just differently because the question is, is, is a little bit about, you know, the type of graphene that you start with, right, and the influence that that has. Um, maybe you could address what, you know, we talked here about graphene. Are we talking only about graphene oxide is a candidate for functionalization or are we talking about, you know, graphene nanoplatelets or other forms of graphene that can also be functionalized. That, that's, so we said in our presentation there, we've got over 250 types there. Um, graphene oxide, um, for me, is essentially a, a graphene with high levels of oxygen on the surface of it, and traditionally produced through wet chemistry methods and that sort of thing. Um, we deal with few layered graphenes. We deal with carbon blacks, recovered carbon blacks. We deal with carbon nanotubes. Uh, we deal with a blend of all of them, as well as you can also functionalize other materials like boronitride, ceramics, and even finished components there as well. Um, what material we use and when comes down a lot to experience then. Um, but if you're thinking about if you're wanting to do a barrier coating, you would want to probably have something with a more sheet-like structure, like an FLG, 
uh, if you're trying to do something uh, for tensional properties, then you could use a rope-like structure like carbon nanotubes. So this is where you start to understand where you might want to do it. So a lot of our elastomers might focus on carbon nanotubes or a mix, and a lot of our corrosion paints might try to have the highest surface area as well. Uh, and it comes down to cost, because usually the, the thinnest and largest surface area can have a higher cost. So if you can functionalize something uh, that might be a bit more spherical in shape, that gives you the same benefit as an expensive sheet, and that might be a benefit of it as well. Excellent. Well, let's let's do this. I, I, I would like to conclude by, by saying, you know, it, it's quite obvious that, first of all, this functionalization process just offers up more opportunities and avenues to improve the material, which is already extraordinary on its own. Uh, this slide uh, I like to show because it just shows um, all the different application areas where graphene can apply. It's just astounding. And this, uh, this presentations that we saw today touched on a number of these, but they really show that it just opens up more avenues to get not you know a 5% or a 10% improvement, but we see 30, 40, 50% lifts and performance characteristics, which is astounding. And for those companies that are participating today that haven't yet decided to join the Graphene Council, um, we really encourage you to join. I hope this webinar is just a small vignette of the type of information that we have within our network and the strength of having companies in the entire value chain that really understand this material and can help you with your engineering challenges to, uh, to use advanced materials to solve tomorrow's problems. Uh, and, and so we encourage you to join and, and be part of this. So John, Mark, and, and Kevin, I wanna thank you both for taking the time to prepare these presentations and to share your expertise with us. And uh, we appreciate you being part of the Graphene Council community. So thank you for that. Hello, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm. yeah.